circulation of everybody's comfort. And in case you don't know already, the restroom is down the hall and on the left, the second door on the left. Um, so let's begin. Uh, two years ago, exactly two years ago, our dear friend of the Shelter Island Historical Society passed away, Horace Compton, and he gave us, left us, a very generous gift of British Woolworths, otherwise known as Woolies. I will tell you when I received the phone call, I had no idea what a Woolie was. <laughs> All kinds of things went through in my mind. Um, I have since learned quite a bit about these fascinating pieces of artwork. And we're very, very privileged today to have Paul Van Mikar here to help us learn about British Woolworths and how fascinating they are. And on that note, I think we're going to go Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To introduce myself, I'm Paul Van Mikar. I'm an antique dealer. And uh, um, we used to be in Manhattan. I'm now in Pennsylvania now. We specialize in 18th century, 19th century objects mostly ceramics, but about 20 years ago I discovered what is, and I never looked back. And um, I'm going to talk about these, and as we'll see in a moment, it's not just British, they were done in America too. And uh, um, we'll start to, what they are is a material called Berlin wool, and they were done on a material called duck, it's a type of linen. And I'm going to show you what all that means in a moment. Let me just put my clock on so I don't go over the walk here. So, you see a fantastic woody here, and this is as good as it gets. And as you see, there's an American flag, and probably done by um, immigration, very different um, in, in the 19th century, and basically, in the 18th and 19th century, basically, when people turned up and they stayed, they became American. And a lot of British sailors worked on American ships, and then Americans worked on uh, British ships, these are merchant ships. And here you have this sort of incredible scene of a bay filled with ships, and uh, you've got wonderful color in there, you've got lots of subjects, and you see there's even an early photograph of uh, the man who made it. Developed an industry 
where people um, created images of um, these embroideries, which you've probably seen if you've gone to antique shows, you've seen the romantic images, um, they can be religious, they could be animals, and so on. And this started in the early 19th century. But by the 1850s, um, an, a, a material, an analyte dye, was, became available. And this was a British invention, but it allowed the wool to be dipped in vast vats. And a material that had been quite expensive and not available to the man in the street became extremely cheap and available. And it became a huge fad. And these images were created by the end of the century, over 27,000 different images were created according to the VNA, and probably more. And you could buy just the image and a piece of paper which you pinned to the background. Um, you could buy a whole kit with the wool, with the instructions. So this wool was available everywhere, and it was available. So in the, in the 18th century and early 19th century, guilds in England were the only people that could make textile pictures. The man in the street, you couldn't go and make a picture. The guild made it. With the availability of this um, material, it allowed working class people to have pictures and have pictures made themselves that they, they didn't have to rely on someone else to do it. So when these sailors went to sea, this wool was available everywhere. In every store, it was inexpensive, and the men took, were given it. Every woman in their lives um, had, um, were making these images and with his wife. Now here you see a sailor actually doing this needlework. Now the needlework is not what the sailor's wool works are. Needlework is where you, it, 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 it's a different system. What the sailor's walls that we have upstairs and we're going to talk about, they used a cross stitch and a long stitch. And instead of following a pattern, they created images of ships that they knew. This is another image of a, of a, of a wall work. As you see here, there's another one Washington, at the American market. One of the problems with the dye, this, this anodyne dye, was, I wish they didn't know at the time, the colors were very strong and very bright. It's actually very interesting that this fad with these walls was one of the first time cultural, the strong dramatic colors that were, of course, introduced with Albert, um, the Queen Victoria's uh, husband, um, but what they didn't know is over time there would be chemical reactions with light and the color would be lost. So here you have a very typical woody, and you'll see most of them upstairs are like this, but it's lost its color. And that's what the color should have been and would have been. And, but that light baby blue disappeared. And of course when they created these, this is what they looked like. They were very bright. And a lot of people may not like them because of that. They were a bit garish. So, take the sailors doing war work. Well, they did all sorts of things. Um, you're quite familiar with the scrimshaw. Um, they did rope work. They made baskets. They made all sorts of things. Sailors' boxes. Uh, this is a sailor's chest. Um, here they're doing is a tattoo. So the idea of doing art on board a ship and a man doing it was very natural. It wasn't a, a woman's work or anything like that. It was just something they did. Now, the British Navy didn't have an official uniform until um, the late uh, 1850s, 1857. And they had um, what they called scrubs, and they just swapped straw. And it was just a very plain uniform made of this duck, this linen, which, was a, which you could buy as a uniform from shops on, on board some of the bigger ships from, from the ports. And, um, if you were at sea, if you were going out to Asia, you were at sea for four years, you had to know how to repair. And because you didn't want to go out and buy another uniform, you repaired. So again, working with wool, working with other these textile materials was, was second nature to the men. So one of the funny stories, when you start with these, the, these pictures are really windows into a culture, and they're so fascinating. So um, there wasn't an official uniform. But certain captains paid for their men to have uniforms. 
And one of the most uh, infamous events of the 19th century of the British Navy was the captain of HMS Harlequin decided to dress his men as Harlequins. <laughs> <laughs> I have no record of the images of that, but this is the figurehead, which is in the Maritime Museum in Greenwich, and you can imagine. And it was a huge embarrassment for the British Navy. And after that, it was decided um, to go a different way. So, um, here you have a picture that was given by Albert of Victoria of Prince Albert um, dressed as a sailor. And he's not dressed as an officer, he's dressed as a, a common a seaman. And it's thought that part of this was political to in, in, in dear the royal family to the common man. But, um, and this was in 1846. Now, in the 18th century and 19th century, impression was an important part of the British Navy. And as you see here, during the Battle of Trafalgar, over half the Navy's 120,000 sailors were impressed. And what that meant is the Navy would just go and grab you off the streets. If you were a merchant ship coming in um, mm -hmm. to port, the Navy would go out, collect the able boarded men, take them off the ships and put them on a Navy ship, and they were out. And their families may not see them for many, many years or months if they survived. So it was a very tough life. And the, the, the sailor, and in the beginning part of the uh, 19th century, was considered a drunkard and no good, which again is kind of part of that was true in the sense that they emptied out prisons and uh, debtors' prisons and so on to take men. And so part of you know, that, that reputation came from that. But as you saw with that image from, uh, the, 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 of, of the royal family, the people begin to look at the sailors differently. So the impressment became socially unacceptable um, after, the, after the Napoleonic War. So the Navy came up with various plans to um, basically create a career structure for these sailors. And what that involved is instead of um, generally when you went to sea, and a lot of the sailors would go on a merchant ship, the next time it might be a navy ship, you joined up with a captain that you liked, and you would go, but this is going to be North Sea, I'm going to be gone for six months, three months, I'm going to Pacific, it's four years, and you signed on for that. When you came back, you were unemployed, you have to either go back on another ship. So your, your income was based on this. So the Navy created a career structure. They, a lot of boys were in the Navy, so they created schools for them. One of the things they taught them was how to sew and make uniforms and so on. And this, again, allowed the men to have a regular income. And in my opinion, this is one of the reasons that these war works were able to be created, because now the men had the time to make them. And as we saw in that second one, it says worked at sea, but I don't, I believe the majority of them were probably done when they were in between journeys on ships or even in retirement. Um, the Crimea War. So we've talked about um, the material, the fact that this material was available and inexpensive. And one of the other things with, um, when you're on these ships and they were very cold and so on, was something called small work. Doing, using your hands to make things that help keep you nimble and was encouraged. So you had all of that. But then in the 1850s, you had the Crimea War, which was a fascinating war. It's a modern marvel of technology. So everything changed. And here you have an image of a you know, British ship with, uh, um, in the Crimea. But what happened during the Crimea, by the end of the war, the telegraph had got to the front. To, and so communication between um, the generals and uh, the, 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 the war office in London ended up being two hours. So communication was completely different. But one of the biggest things was the newspapers, the Times, and a journalist called Russell. And he um, reported on the conditions of the war front. And of course, Britain hadn't been in, in, invaded since the Normans, 
economy successfully. And as a consequence, people had no idea of war. You know, war was controlled by the elites, by the army, of what it was about. And in this war, people saw how dirty and disgusting and bloody it was. And the public turned and, and, and saw the, the soldiers and sailors in a completely different light. Here's another woody. And you can see the, the range of subjects is just extraordinary done by these men. But you're, you come from a small village somewhere and you, you're in these strange places. It's, it's extraordinary. This is one of the great woodies that I owned many years ago. And um, it's this giant feat. And it's actually a naval inspection of the Queen's birthday in 54. But they, this fleet went up to the Baltic. So what if we call it the Crimean War, Russia had a fleet of 28 major ships in the Baltic. And they wanted to go up there before, um, the, um, before these ships got out. And so while the Queen was inspecting, the tides turned and the, the ships left. <laughs> and to have so many. But again, you can see those ships in the front are what's called first rate ships. And ships were rated by the number of guns on board. And um, you have first rate, the, the next row is with two, two rows of um, decks. Uh, then second rates in the back, you see like a frigate. And they can be fourth and fifth rates. And basically, the, the old battle plans were the ships sail towards your enemy and, and then they turn. And each of these ships had 120, 130 guns on board cannon. And as they turned, half of those guns were firing. And you have ships from both sides firing. It was just extraordinary, you know, the, the, the carnage that it could, could cause. And then the, the frigates and other ships corralled the, uh, the enemy into the firing zone to be destroyed. So with put is this, as I said, it's always a story. It's a window into another world. And I found this one, and obviously you see it's a Russian fort and British ships chasing um, a Russian a couple of Russian ships. And thank God for the internet and Google, and I put in round four to Crimea War, and I discovered this particular battle, and this was a, a harbor. And the Crimea War was fought on um, the Allied side, and that was Britain, France, Turkey, and Sardinia, the Naples. What they were doing there, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the British and the French transported their own troops. So the French ships, off to the, to, to the right, um, dropped British Marines behind the fort and they attacked it and they, they won. And it was very important because it took control of the, the entrance of the Baltic City. But again, you see this great color, great composition. If you're buying waters, this is you know, what I try and find. Uh, because they're just so exciting when you see that. So this is one from upstairs, and you can see, um, again, great composition. You've still got, you've got a grey blue in the, in the background, which is what its original colour was. I'm not sure, but it was a type of blue, but it still creates a really strong image. So um, here's the Duke of Wellington, a very famous big ship. Um, it was laid down in 1849. And, um, here it is um, being launched, and it was launched as the Windsor Castle. But on the day the ship was launched, the Duke of Wellington died, and it was renamed. But when it was laid in plan, it was an all wood ship with just sails, and it was already archaic. They already needed um, uh, steam propulsion. Now, the British Navy had been using steam propulsion since the beginning of the um, 19th century, but they were side wheelers, and on a gunship it was no good because the side wheelers would be in the way where the guns were. But when they built this, they then put it back in dry dock, cut the ship in half, mm -hmm. and widened it and lengthened it, and put in uh, screw propulsion, mm -hmm. and it went to sea. Mm -hmm. But all the ships that this happened to are basically, they're wood. And it, there's this constant battle between what the guns were doing. So the French invented a, a new type of rifle and um, cannon. It would go straight through the wood. So now you needed iron, you needed steel, you needed chains. They're heavy. The heaviness meant you had to have bigger engines. So the race of technology with these ships was extraordinary. 
And the sailors were all aware of this, and they were part of it. So they were on the most advanced ships in the world over time. And again, they, you know, they really began to take pride in, in, in what they did. Now, going back to the Crimea War, um, you've all heard of Florence Nightingale. And when the, when the war started, it started very badly for the British. The, all their supplies for animals and, and, and food was destroyed. The ships in a big storm, not enemy action. And the conditions at the front were terrible. In fact, they were so bad, the Queen fired the Prime Minister because of the time since reporting on the conditions of the men. And she was so horrified that her sailors were being treated, and, and soldiers were being treated this way. And Florence Nightingale wanted to go, and she wasn't allowed to go. She was a woman, and what does she know? And she's only a nurse, but between the times putting pressure, the first social media campaigns of, of the modern era, um, the, the Navy allowed the, her to go with 38 nurses. And when she arrived, the conditions were so terrible. Men were left for four days before they got treated. They were covered in lice and bugs and uh, dirty bandages. And the men were dying. I mean, it was just absolutely terrible. And as I said, the newspapers were reporting on this. She got there. She was a wealthy woman, which was unusual because nurses were not considered a type of employment for, for, for a wealthy woman. And she bossed her way around. And the generals and officers hated her, said she was unfeminine, of course, famous for that <laughs> description of any woman who uh, is powerful and strong that way. But she stood up for herself. And in a short period of time, um, from basically about 70% of the men dying um, in hospitals, it went down to about 40 mm -hmm. She had clean bandages, she gave them food, she bought plates and knives and food and, and bought it with her own money. And she, she got the kitchens cleaned and uh, the rooms cleaned. And uh, it, it revolutionized. But what's also interesting is something to do with the waters, because I think that that's the great thing with a subject like this is it's a window into this whole world that's so wonderful. She kept notes, statistical notes, of what worked and what didn't work. And after the war, she became the first woman to become a member of the Royal Statistical Society in England. And um, her work that she did there was applied. She started a school and sent out nurses all over England, and she revolutionized healthcare in Britain um, based on her work here. Now, a lot of the fighting, much of the fighting was done by soldiers, but some of it, important battles, were done by sailor brigades. And they were sailors who were sent on shore and they fought as soldiers. And again, this was reported back. So again, it was part of this process of the sailor's reputation changing and becoming more important. So, ships. It wasn't just for our Navy ships. This is the SS Great Britain, the Great, Great Eastern. Um, there's a little label on this one that says it's laying this transatlantic cable. Um, there were three attempts, uh, two successful. Well, one that was successful was the third one. The second one, they lost the cable. And uh, somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, but the captain had recorded exactly where it was. And when they went back to grapple it, it was there. They found it in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> pulled it up, and reconnected it. The first cable only lasted three weeks. It was early technology. Queen Victoria sent a message to Buchanan. I think it took 17 hours to transmit one sentence. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot quicker than um, going over by sea, by ship, and transmitting. <laughs> so this ship, you know, again, you know, these sailors, they, they were part of the technology, they were on the cutting edge of technology. The Great Eastern was the largest ship ever built, 1858, carried 4,000 passengers. It's the longest ship that wasn't matched for 1899, the tonnage wasn't matched in 1901, and um, passenger was 1913, Brunel, who was one of the greatest. I think he's considered the second most important man in Britain in terms of scientists, um, by the public. This is voted by the public. 
and at the end of its life it became a cable laying ship. But interesting for you here, when it made one of its first trips to New York, um, it hit rocks off a of Montauk. They did not know they hit the rocks because it was the first or second double hulled ship. Mm -hmm. oh. And when it got into port, a huge gash was in the side, and they didn't even know they hit it because the, the double hull saved the ship and the technology worked. It was so far in advance of his, of his uh, age. So here's a schooner. You see, it's an American ship. When I first got this, I said, Gibraltar, what's an American ship? Doing in Gibraltar. Being made in Gibraltar. Well, Gibraltar is in Michigan. Just outside of Detroit. <laughs> and was the ship that sailed on the Great Lakes. I sold it to a client um, from Canada. And after, you know, bought it, he bought lots of different ships. And I said, why did you like this one? It's because I own ships on the Great Lakes. <laughs> Should have told me that first. <laughs> so, again, telling a story. Are anyone familiar with the Brooklyn? So, this ship sailed um, out of um, New York. It was um, hired by the Mormons. The Mormons were told to get out of the United States by the leader. And of course, the majority cross country and in uh, carts. But a group in New York were told to go around to San Francisco and or the West Coast anyway, and set up a colony there for the Mormons and start preparing for when people came across the country. So, again, when I found this, it doesn't say the Brooklyn, but it had the name Brooklyn, the Brooklyn on the uh, back of the frame. And I go, Brooklyn's big naval yard. And a friend of mine said, no, it is. It's the Brooklyn. So this group of uh, Mormons, families, left. They took the first uh, big printing press, because they were setting up a new colony, basically, on the West Coast. Um, it was a terrible journey. I read that it was 24,000 miles. I, I can't, I have to work that out. It seems like a big number, but anyway, it went almost over to Africa because of winds, round the Cape, which was absolutely, uh, it was terrible. Um, they went to the islands that uh, um, Robinson talked about to get water, and then they go, went up to the same thing called the Sandwich Islands, which is Hawaii, and they got fruit and water. And they sailed into San Francisco Harbor, and in the six months that they were at sea, San Francisco, uh, California became American. <laughs> so they were welcomed by the American cavalry, American flag. So after all of that, they never left the United States. <laughs> so in the game, it's, it's a window into history. You learn so much. You know all of these things I didn't know before, and. The men, they, they ended up, many in state, they set up the, that, that printing press became the first newspaper in, in San Francisco. And some of them did um, work when the gold rush came along. A lot of the Mormons made a lot of money by directing them to where the gold was and making money out of uh, in, with clothing and other things. So, the hero, this is another great ship. There's a picture of it, a painting of it. And what it's famous for is the Prince of Wales came to the Americas on this ship. He was the first royal prince to come to the Americas. And he came initially to Canada. The Queen couldn't come. I think she was pregnant and couldn't come. And the Prime Minister Palmerston recommended that um, the prince represent, and I think he was very young, I remember thinking, 90 years old. Albert was completely against it. He thought he was incompetent, and if you've ever seen Victoria and all this, their relationship was not good. But he came, he opened Parliament, I think it was in Quebec, who invited him to join him. He <laughs> was decided not to do that. But Buchanan, the president, invited him to come to the United States. So he went to Washington and was very successful, went to New York, and huge crowds greeted him. So again, this is, you know, what, 70 years after the revolution. <laughs> Now he's a hero, and people are just so interested to see him. But again, that shit is a window into this information. Now you see in this wall, 
you have these theatrical curtains. And there's two elements to this, and we'll see a, a few more of this in a moment. Um, because of their reputation for drinking and being no good, there were many Christian organizations that created entertainment that was healthy for the sailors. They included theater in Portsmouth. And so, the, and many of the sailors went to it because it, I think it was free or very inexpensive. So here you have the theatrical thing that maybe was in their mind because they had seen it in Preston. Later on, that curtain looks a bit different and we feel that instead of it being a theatrical curtain, it's a trade union banner. <laughs> <laughs> so, subjects. Here's the outlook. It was again a mission to, for, for the spiritual uh, well-being of sailors. And this, the Albert um, took care of, uh, went out to ships in the North Sea. There's a photograph of it. You can see it's pretty close. We're always looking with the sailors' war work, different subjects. Here you have sailors on the yard. And this was a tradition that started if you went into a port where you that was not so friendly, the sailors would be on the yard to show that they weren't manning the guns and that you were um, friendly. But you see the ships that are anchored, it's in review, and maybe a member of the royal family is reviewing it, or an admiral, and they're all out there in the best clothes. Um, Wells Henderson um, was a famous collector of maritime material. He opened a museum in Philadelphia, and eventually sold his collection in a 40 museum. But um, he bought this from me, and what you have here is Tower Bridge, which, of course, um, we all know, but this, you probably know, was the bridge that the Americans that bought London Bridge thought they were buying when they put it in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so they were very, they were very um, <laughs> surprised not to see towers when they rebuilt it. And there you have a liner. So this is, you know, you're getting on. But here you have two ships at the front are known as Thames Barges. And I'm going to show you a picture of them in a moment. Here you have the pictures, the husband and wife. And again, all this great, great color. And you see that work around the bottom. It looks just like the embroidery that we saw earlier um, in the Berlin work. So this is one that's upstairs. Again, another ship fully dressed. And you've got those long boats uh, with sailors in them and rowing out to the ship. You've got the buildings behind, which is really nice. And if you see that little Union Jack on the front there, that means there's um, an admiral or vice admiral so lots of, there's always these different signs that you know you read. The, the, the color of the banner meant it was either arriving in port or was leaving port. They went all Royal Navy, the merchant ship and his little yacht, fully dressed again for you know for a particular event. Here's one with a troop ship, the Himalaya. This was another ship that was bought, uh, built by the PO. It was the largest ship of its time at the time and they couldn't make a go of it. For them, thank God, the Crimea came along and the Navy took it as, as a troop ship and bought it off of them. And then you see the torpedo boats in front, which um, they, they, there was a new invention um, of the, the torpedo that was air propulsion. So these ships went out to try and, they weren't very successful. Now, a lot of ships um, are not named and you kind of try and look at them by their class. You know, if it's a type of ship, how many guns did it have, what type of rigging did it have, and sometimes you, because they were constantly changing, they were constantly changing to make it faster or better. But if you have a name, you're way ahead of the game. Here's the Nautilus. This is one of the Flying Squadron, which I've just sold, and you see each one's... Um, so the fight after the Crimea War, the um, Navy cut down the number of ships. But they created these flying squadrons that could kind of travel as a group around the, the world and visit the empire and, and, fly, and show the flag and if, if they were needed. The other thing with this is this incredible sea, this sort of choppy sea, which I love. And it's one of the things when you, with, with what is that you want to try and find. Another name, one of this is Sign. On the right there, you see the, the, the man, the sailor's name. Um, one of the most interesting. And I couldn't find a picture of it, and I never took a picture of the label, but I had this wonderful wally, and it was just a ship, and it was really heavy, and, and when we do shows, the walls are you know, a bit dodgy. So I got my framer to take it off and, and, and 
see what was behind. And there was this label that said, um, HMS Doris, 1865, done in my carrier's own hand, not to leave the family. So again, confirmation that a man did it, he gave it to his wife, they weren't commercial, um, but they were, they were gifts to, to, to... Now I say composition, you can see it, it's just so powerful, that look, you know, fully dressed ship again, um, we've got a British fort behind, and um, another woody, again, I, I didn't pull up the photograph of it, but it was just a British a ship with a, with, a, with a fort like this with a British flag, and you know, where could it be? It could be anywhere. Huge empire at the end. But again, I took a, took the back up, and on the back was a description of where it was. And unbeknownst to me, in the early part of the 19th century, um, and this was part of what was going on with the Crimea War, the Ottoman Empire was breaking up, and parts of it were trying to break away, and Greece was trying to break away. <coughs> and a group of islands broke away, formed their own country, and asked Britain to, to treat them like a protectorate. So the British were there to protect them from Turkey. And without that information, it was just an image. But having that information on the back just changed everything, as far as I'm concerned. Here's a lovely one upstairs. It's a wonderful, folky look. Um, it's very upright. You wonder um, if it could actually ever sell. But it has this wonderful charm because of that. Here's one that's uh, Ship, same type of thing where it's been completely upright, very stylized, very folky, and signed with the letters FN. Uh, this is one I, I have at the moment. I just love this because you've got this incredible wall, and the ships have little flags that are associated with Malta. So it could be Malta. Mm -hmm. But I just look at it, the color, the composition, everything going on. And you can see the incredible variety of these pictures. Now I talk about the Thames Barge, here's the Thames Barge, closer up with the Harry and Nelly. Well, Harry and Nelly were probably the owners, and these were designed to be, they, they, took, um, they, they took material from the Port of London around the coast and delivered it. And they could be run by one person, because of the way that the, the sails were set up. But what's interesting is they had these red sails, and the red sails were associated with fishermen in Cornwall who used to fish herring, and the herring went away. And the villages literally upped and came round to Essex with their ships and with their technology. To get it red, they used horse urine and earth. <laughs> and it made them very strong and very distinctive. And they continued on on these ships like this. <laughs> and there is a society in England that tries to preserve these. And they gave me information about this. <laughs> Now, one of the things that also added, again, you, look, you can see, again, it looks like the, uh, the um, embroidery we saw earlier, and they've added beads. And lots of times when you get the uh, portholes, they put beads on the portholes to represent the guns. Now, this is going back to the theatrical or union, his wonderful one. This is the Duke of Wellington again, um, but you've got the flags. And m most often, Sometimes they have the American flag, and we don't know why, because America wasn't an ally in the war and you know, had been a, an enemy at the beginning of the century. But um, this is one upstairs for the dress. I'm sorry for the, we couldn't get with the light reflecting. But you see, very folky, but you have um, Greece, and you have British flags, and the American flag there too. This one's wonderful with that checkerboard in the front. Again, you know, Turkish flag, the Greek flag, the British flags, and um, I think that's the flag of, uh, of, of uh, Sicily. Sometimes they have the photographs, like we saw at the beginning, and they're hard to sell as a dealer. <laughs> they're wonderful academically, but people don't like them because it's not them. But the composition here was, was so nice, it's like, I don't care. <laughs> and what's interesting is, when you get these, they're called, sometimes they're called telescopic views, so you're looking at a ship through a tow. Sometimes they have a life preserver mm -hmm. around them. So you have variations on that theme. But the ship in the middle often is um, very secondary. It's the flags, it's the main thing. And here and on some of the others I have, I 
forgot to mention it, are very well done. And that's, again, one of the things that you're trying to look for when you find these. Here you see a, a, um, a page from the Frank Messis, American Boys, the Girls Weekly, with all the flags. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the sailors took something like this and used it for the source material for their flags. Here's another one that's signed, 1860. This one, again, signed, superb of London, and it's got Eve Pill, and we know that he lived in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. So again, confirmation that the man, the men did it, the sailor did it, not, not a wife or, or someone else. Or I would not be surprised if sometimes they did. Here's another one that's dated, fully dressed. Not everything was um, ships. It was related. Here you have you know, the, the, the Christian creed of faith, hope, and charity with the cross and the sail and the heart. They came from the land. Here's the steam engine. They're not really woolies, they're wool worked, but they're not woolies. We use the word woolly really when they're ships. Here's a, here's a, here's a, um, yeah. And here we have a volcano. Now, if you come from England, you don't see volcanoes. So again, that was something really special to, to that, that sailor. Very bad storm. Um, I didn't have time to dig out, but this was a known ship. It says on the bottom what it was, and it got caught in a storm off of um, um, Canada. And they were in the storm for over two weeks. They survived, but it was just an extraordinary competence of the captain to keep his men and the ship alive. Is another one. It makes you seasick just looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> really well done. You got the subject. Here's a wonderful Jewish one with a sailor and his wife. I've never seen another one, a complete one off, but all of these are So many of these I've never seen before or after. Here's another lovely detail on, on a river with marines being rowed down the river to the ships. You see the sea, it's incredible sea. Guess where that came from? Yeah. Right? This was one of the most popular prints of the time and obviously influenced them. There's another one that's an American ship again. This is a battle that was actually during the, 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 um, the 1812 war. Didn't know what it was, but then I did some research and there's the painting. See the date, 1846. So this was probably done having seen the print and maybe someone's grandfather was on, involved in that and they created the woody after the fact. Now, as I said, most of these were done by the sailors for their own families. They were done as gifts and given to them. I've had them from my brother to my sister, all sorts of things like that. Here's a, a, an old postcard where they call it a cripple soldier, I'm sure, as a sailor, and on against the wall are sailors' war works that he has made for sale. And of course, if you were crippled, as they said then, um, being able to have a, a skill that allowed you to um, earn money and, and look after yourself was very important. And he took that skill and, and, and made a life of himself. Not, here's, here's the sailor's the soldier's return. And that's a very important subject in Woodard. These are always worth a lot more. People love them. His, here he is returning. The family is very patriotic with the flag. And there he's leaving. She doesn't want him to go. <laughs> and you get pottery and other subjects and all sorts of things. And then to finish off, um, and then, so I just went to, so I talked about the light and, and the change of color. Now, you see the blue on the uniform, how different it is. It's completely gone. It's still a charming woody, but it was very different when it was made. And to finish up, I've just got this. This again is not sailors. This is a, a wall from the end of the 19th century, and it was a regiment that in, introduced these tartan troops, and they brought in very short men to wear them. And here are the two short men in the front. <laughs> <laughs> so to end up, um, you know, this is not a woolly, this is a wall work. But it, the sailors went from being drunkards and ill conceived to being Jack Tar, heroes of the British Empire. And that was the journey they took to become that. And they created these images out of pride of who they were and where they were and what they were part of. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Did you know of Warren Scott for this collection? I didn't. No one knew about it. <laughs> it was a secret collection. <laughs> How large is it in relationship to other collections? I have clients that have hundreds of them in their house. Wow. And sometimes the people that have hundreds in their house have four or five houses. They have one in New York, they have one in Palm Beach, they have one in Maine, and they're filled with, uh, um, with, with uh, there's a lady called Susan Dillon, who's from the publishing company, and she had them in her home in New Jersey and New York, but she lived up in, in um, Northeast Harbor in Maine, and she was English, and I went and had tea with her, and we had tea and we had sherry. <laughs> and she was a lovely lady, her husband had been part of, I think, the Kennedy administration and all this, and she, just, she had a beautiful collection, and she decided to give it to the Northeast Harbor Library, where they are now, on the wall. But what she did was she brought in a professional photographer, photographed them at incredibly high resolution, mm -hmm. had frames made that looked like the original frames, and hung those in her house, okay. and got those through. I mean, you wouldn't know until you went up there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And then she gave them, because she wanted the local kids to be inspired by it. Oh. Um, sailing and their heritage in terms of ships. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the few places where there's a big collection of what is this one. Could you speak to the influence of Japanese woodblock prints on, on these? Because it, it does look like the same waves and everything. I think it, you know, that was the most popular, uh, one of the most popular prints of the 19th century. And you know, these sailors would, would have been exposed to it. And someone would go, ah, you know, that, I can do that. It looks like the sea. The sea is amused to it. But that's the influence. I don't think it's like they, they copied other things. Um, on the subject of copying, um, I actually learned this point, I didn't know this, that um, the Chinese had um, paddle wheels and had since the 13th century. And um, they used slaves to turn the wheels instead of having an engine. But the British felt they copied them. They didn't know the history. And so they felt the Chinese had copied them um, with these paddle wheels. Um, so, uh, two questions. One is, what was the average length it would take someone to do something like this? Would it be... I don't know. Is anyone that makes something like this? I've got no idea. Like, like there's, just, is, there's no narrative of just it, the time? It's a very frustrating time. subject. Yeah. Um, there's, we, we haven't found any diaries, because these kind of men probably didn't have diaries and, and all of this. Um, there, there's a, two ladies did an exhibition in, in England at Compton Varney, which is a famous uh, house museum, and they did one on what is they did a PhD, and they sent me a copy of it, and that's the only sort of academic. And their subject matter was the, the Greenwich uh, Maritime Museum had been given a bunch of woodies that had been owned by three or four different families, and so they knew where they came from, and they traced back what boats they were on and saw how. And I didn't mention this, but. Certain um, ships turn up at the time, Duke of Wellington, the Queen, um, and probably when someone saw me doing it, they go, well, I can do that, and they copy it. So it, it, it moved from one ship to another, and then when these ships came into port together, they saw men doing it. You saw that uh, stretcher earlier on, and they you know, stick it under their pillow, so to speak, um, into their bedding, and just do this over time. The big ones that we like I show here, and you can see some upstairs, that I, I find hard to believe that they did that on board the ship. And is this a lost art? No, um, there are things to them, so you have to be careful when buying. Um, and then there are people who just like to make, like people, I didn't touch on Sailor's Valentines, I don't know if you're familiar with Sailor's Valentines, mm -hmm. but they're the uh, hexagonal boxes of seashells, which were made in Bermuda. But their call sex that clients because many, many sailors apparently told their wives that they made it for them. <laughs> <laughs> but we now know that they were made commercially in, uh, in uh, Barbados. We found labels inside there's one an Englishman opened a business there and had them made in the past and say, let people pick up water and put food. I know. So, you know, people, I, I just don't know, you know. 
chancellor. Well, you mentioned uh, you mentioned frames. Were they circular frames? Uh, did they stretch it in order to stretch those long threads? That yes, when you well, saw that circular one, I mean, again, yeah. we don't really know. But I will say this: um, that with these woodies, you know, they were made the sort of 1760s through to the end of the uh, set, and the first exhibition of them was in 1927 at the museum related to the Victorian album. And as they were all framed differently, they decided to use these maple frames that many of these have, like you have here, to make the exhibition consistent. And that became a tradition. So you'll see a lot of people say, oh, it's the original frame. You know, it's, it's been done. This isn't the same, but I saw um, a beautiful exhibit at the Folk Art Museum in New York of Civil War soldiers making very intricate quilts yes. from the woolen blankets and uniforms, and mainly done while they were recuperating from war wounds. And I just wondered, in relation to these, what kind of market there is between the two. Like, are there many of those? And of the quilts? I, I know nothing. I saw the yeah. exhibition in Vermont, actually. Mm. Burlington, um, Shelburne, and fantastic. Um, but it's a different subject. Yeah. You know, people like these with their ships. Yeah. I provide the history, and some people <laughs> don't care, and some people love it. I have a competitor who doesn't really do them anymore, but not for out of business with these, who just would sort of buy them, hang them, and not. I mean, it's a lot of work. So when these come in, they've been in tobacco filled rooms. They open on the back, maybe bugs have got in or might have got in, so we have to change the glass to UV glass or museum glass, we have to clean them. Cleaning alone is five or six or seven hundred dollars each if, if it needs it. You know, the glass is a couple of hundred dollars, if it's a big one, it could be four hundred or five hundred dollars. And then if we have to have a frame made, it's another four, you know, it's a, it's a big investment before you even start. Um, but otherwise they, they, they won't, you know, get preserved. And uh, you know, I, I'd love to be able to, to preserve this because you know it's such a wonderful art. I have a question. Uh, I know it's upstairs. I was looking. None of them seem to be individually signed or credited to an individual. Uh, is it that do you have the individual artists, or are these just collect? collected in mass and just say, uh, you don't know who individually... Think of it this way, when you take a photograph, or your parents took a photograph, yeah. and they die, you go to that box, yeah. thanks for coming, and you look, and who is this person? Yeah. They didn't need to know because they knew, but the next generation didn't. Yeah. So with these, when they were made, they were given to a sister, a mother, a, a member of their family, they knew. But after that, it's just a picture. So house. they're not individually credited to anyone. Well, sometimes they are. I've shown a whole bunch of them that had names and initials. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a wonderful one that was signed with just letters, but the ship was named. And I had a researcher who, um, in London who went to Lloyd's, looked up all the records from Lloyd's of that ship over a 10 year period, and there was only one man with those initials. And he said in his, his, uh, his, his contract, comic contract. So sometimes you can get lucky that way. <laughs> Has any vestige of this tradition continued? Well, there are people that still make them, like they do the Valentines. Um, again, because of the walls, they're very bright. They don't, um, some of the fakes being made are extraordinary good. And the fake started because you know, 20 years ago, the big ones, like we've been seeing, could be worth thirty dollars or $40,000. So it was worth a lot of time and effort to, to work. Prices have come down very, very significantly since then. And there's probably less of a, a market that they can work on doing it. But of course, if they're out there and they pass as real, then um, they're floating around. If, if it's being done with wool or duck, <coughs> why is it fake? And, and or is, well, it's not, they're being sold or passed off as nice and sound trade yeah. say as wool yeah. Yeah. And they're just wool works. Yes. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> the wool is different. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't mention this before, but in, interestingly enough, they used this German wool. And the wool came from um, um, Gothgatha 
in Germany, and they had merino sheep that they bred with the Saxon sheep. And you, it was illegal to export sheep out of Spain because they were so valuable, but they were. And they ended up with a herd of over 4,000 and they then bred with Saxon. And that was why the wool was so good <coughs> for drink for this kind of use. <laughs> But in Germany, yeah, but it also had to do with the dye. In other words, you had the Berlin wool, which, which I guess was a certain texture of course of the Merino yeah. Saxon uh, breed. Uh, but you mentioned something about the dyes. Annaline dye. Yeah. When, when did that, that made a big difference. 1846, I think, mm -hmm. it started being introduced. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, was invented and then applied in the 1850s which was just the time these men were the, doing all of this. So it was kind of like, I call it, sometimes when I do this tour, I call it the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. You know, you have all the events going on, you have the availability of the wool, mm -hmm. and you have the money being able to come in that they can afford to use, and those sort of things led them to be able to create. So woolies are basically post-1840. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've seen old books and call 1820, 1840, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 